would like to thank uh, Isabel Kumar who accepted to act as a moderator and also to all the panelists. Uh, we're looking forward to learn more about this important topic for the EU. So I pass my word on to Isabel, please. Hello everybody and many thanks uh, Maya for that introduction. So it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Because we're talking about European strategic autonomy, but in many respects, nobody really knows what that means. Everybody's got a bit of a different definition. So what we're gonna do in this discussion is try and gain some clarity from our fantastic speakers today to try and understand a little bit more about what they understand by European strategic autonomy and what its implications might be across a number of topic areas. But before I begin, just something very interesting when I was reading into this, I was reading something that Joseph Beret said, and now he is obviously Europe's foreign policy chief. Now, he said European strategic autonomy is all about the EU's political survival. Interesting though, that we don't really know exactly what that means and what the implications are. And that's why this panel is all the more valuable. So. Before I whistle on much, much longer, let me introduce you to our speakers today. And I'm absolutely delighted that we're joined by Dr. Nicholas Helwig. Now he is the leading researcher at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And he's written a number of uh, documents and theses about this issue. So he comes with a wealth of knowledge. We're also joined by Mr. Mark Van Hooplen, who is the ambassador at large for climate diplomacy at the European External Action Services. And also when we talk about this issue of strategic autonomy, climate is a big topic here, but Mr. Van Hooplen also has uh, experience across a number of other issues, uh, particularly trade. We're also joined by Jim Kloos, who's the Secretary General of TEPSA. Many thanks, uh, hello Jim. And Natalie Tocci, who is the Director of the Istituto Affari Internazionali, which is based in Rome. And uh, just a little note here, Natalie will have to leave us at midday. Um, we'll try and get your closing remarks in early if we possibly can. Uh, if not, apologies uh, if you suddenly disappear. But many thanks to you all for joining us. And I'm Isabel Kumar. I'm moderating this discussion and I'll be guiding you through today's topics. Now, I think the best place to begin really is asking each of our speakers how they would define strategic autonomy when it comes to the EU um, from their particular context of their understanding. And what I'd like to do at the end of the discussion is to see whether their idea and their definition of this has changed at all, because we'll obviously be kind of looking at some of the nitty gritty issues. So will it have changed? So keep that in mind, speakers, uh, for when we come to the end of our discussion. But let me uh, begin with um, Mr. Mark Van Hooplen, if, if you could join us now quickly and tell us how you define the issue of European strategic autonomy today. Thank you, Isabel. Um, a lot has been written about the subject of uh, strategic autonomy. In, in trade terms, it's even called open strategic autonomy. Um, now, this comes from the defense world. Uh, there it is a, um, a well-established concept. Um, I mean, there has been a lot of conceptualization about this subject, and we can go into this. On the other hand, to some extent, for me, this is a bit like... Um, the question of how to define an elephant. Uh, extremely hard to describe what an elephant is. But when the elef elephant enters the room, we all say this is an elephant. Um, and I think it's a bit the same with uh, strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy means in, in uh, external relations in general, but then with regard to trade and climate in particular, to reap the benefits of openness, whilst at the same time making sure you retain the capacity to act in your interests if need be. Um, openness, globalization has brought tremendous benefits, uh, but we've got to make sure that we don't undergo globalization, that we retain our room for maneuver to act autonomously if need be. Because interdependence brings vulnerabilities. And uh, these vulnerabilities are, of course, mutual. 
uh, we are vulnerable to others, others are vulnerable to us. Um, but we've got to make sure that if others want to weaponize that interdependence, that we have answers. And that is, I think, what lies at the heart of strategic autonomy, to make sure we remain in position of enough instruments to tackle uh, any sort of abuses that may come from uh, others wishing to exploit interdependence. So yes to openness, yes to multilateralism, but no to naivete. Um, and that is particularly important uh, these days where you have on the one hand, indeed the importance of multilateralism and internationally based rules that need to be updated, but that takes so much time to update because multilateralism is so slow. And at the same time, we see the return very clearly of 19th century power politics. Um, and we've got to make sure that although we are multilateralist, we also find answers and equip ourselves to make sure that anyone who wishes to exploit uh, this interdependence and vulnerability knows that we will respond. Um, I think that is operationally how we fill in uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, we are working on a number of instruments in that regard. I'm not going to go into that now. I'm certain that we come back to this in the course of the debate, but that is at a general level how I think we should operationalize it. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Now that was absolutely fascinating. I also particularly liked how you introduced this, uh, asking how do you describe an elephant? Because that's very much how I felt, but I hadn't put it into those words when I was thinking about this issue. So um, Jim, I'd like to come to you now and ask you how you describe this elephant. Uh, thanks, Isabel. Yes, I, I will be a bit short because a lot of what Mark has said, uh, uh, I share. I think the best way to start is to look at why this debate arose in the first place. Uh, it arose against the background of a world which is not developed in the way the European Union thought it should develop, a postmodern world. Secondly, it arose out of a context of many crises, some of them almost existential as far as we are concerned. And so there is has been a feeling that the crisis revealed a certain number of weaknesses on our part. We had to react, we had to improvise. Uh, we had to take stopgap measures. Uh, all of this has generated a feeling that Europe needs to become more resilient, more powerful, more capable to act, more autonomous in a way. And this is encapsulated in the concept of strategic autonomy. Uh, there is a definition I rather like, which is Daniel Fiot's uh, definition from the European Union Institute for Studies, who says it's the freedom to act and the freedom from dependence. I would say the freedom from over-dependence, because we live in an integrated world. And maybe very quickly say what it is not. Uh, it is not autarky. It is not protectionism. That would be completely crazy from the biggest trading power in the world and an institution, uh, an organization which is completely integrated into the world. And it's not either an attack on NATO or the transatlantic relationship. That is why when I talk about strategic autonomy, I never start with defense and uh, security because that's the area where it creates misunderstandings. Uh, it is an important part of it, but because of our history after the second world war, if you touch, you start with it, Autonomy sounds like calling into question the arrangements with NATO and all of that. I don't think that's what it should be. Uh, for me, it's a very broad concept. Uh, if you want to do something about strategic autonomy, you have to look at all policies, including internal policies. And I hope we'll come to that in the course of the discussion. Thank you. Absolutely, and do bring that into the discussion if we if we don't hit that topic in time. But it's interesting you should say it is a very broad concept, uh, that it's about the freedom to act. Um, but you say we shouldn't really focus on defence, but really in many respects, I'd say this began with thinking about defence. Um, but anyway, this isn't about me. I'm going to pass on to Natalie Tocci. Uh, Natalie, um, how do you see this concept? Is it a broad concept um, like Jim Clue sees? Uh, is it all about the freedom to act or would you narrow it down in some, in some respects? Thanks, Isabel. Um, 
Well, I would say that if you take the word autonomy, the meaning of autonomy um, is, is in many respects actually quite clear. So autonomy means the ability of the self how to live by its laws, not. Uh, now, it, it's so obvious and so clear that this, it sort of begs the question, um, why has it become an issue now? Uh, now, I think sort of translated into a European Union context, uh, it is indeed about the ability to act. And one could say that the question about the ability to act in one's interest, I wouldn't say sometimes in, in, in one's interest, I would say always in one's interest, because it's really at the heart of what activism is, is really all about. Um, in a sense, has always been the best of uh, the EU's role in the world. I mean, given that we are a rather strange animal, it has always been about the construction of the Union uh, and its ability to act in the world. So if it's kind of, A, the word is so obvious, and B, in a sense, it kind of relates to a project that has been with us for decades now, why has it become a topic now? Why has it become a question now? And I think the answer to that question is that once upon a time we lived in a world in which um, uh, others didn't necessarily want to harm, interfere in different ways, kind of uh, impinge and, and hamper our interests uh, in the way in which uh, is, is today the case. Uh, and this was obviously because we lived in a broader international context that was commonly defined as an international liberal order that was really premised upon the hegemony of uh, the United States. So in security terms, obviously, that uh, was, uh, was the, the international context that we operated in. Uh, and I would say more broadly, uh, that liberal order was one that was really defined by openness, by liberalism. Uh, so in many respects, it echoed many of the things that the EU internally was about. Now, very clearly, that world has changed quite fundamentally. And there are a number of international actors, sometimes they're even allies when they're governed by the likes of Donald Trump, that do want to harm our interests. So at times it you know, happens with allies, far more often obviously it happens with competitors or, or adversaries. I mean, if we think obviously about Russia in the sphere of uh, disinformation, uh, China if we think about the sphere of strategic investments. Uh, so all of a sudden, the question of not only the ability to act, but the ability to live by our laws has become a question in a way in which it never was. So I think it's important to connect, basically, why this issue has become so topical now with the way in which the broader international context has, has changed. And I think this also explains why it is a concept that, as the years have gone on, has been stretched to different policy areas. Indeed, you're right, you know, it started off as a conversation about security and defense, largely because Donald Trump was elected president of the United States and therefore the US security guarantee uh, started being questioned. It then you sort of started, it started stretching to the domains of trade and investment because of the China story, it started being stretched to the question to the areas of cyber disinformation because of the Russia story. So, it's, you know, the, the way in which in policy terms it was expanded to, to different areas is really a question of, uh, you know, it's really a consequence of the international context that, that I was uh, describing a moment ago. Now, just to end this kind of first uh, uh, sort of round, I think it's important to recognize that um, this is uh, a controversial uh, uh, concept, and it's controversial because there are real risks there. I personally don't really buy the, um, you know, we should be careful about it because of the United States point, for the simple reason that I see the security and defense angle of it so far-fetched. Uh, I mean, so kind of, you know, sort of uh, out there. I mean, it's really a matter of kind of decades and we haven't even started. We talk about it a hell of a lot, but we haven't even started. Um, so I don't see it as a realistic proposition. I think that in other areas, I mean, you know, some of the areas that, that Mark was, uh, for instance, referring to, uh, it is a far more tangible, uh, if you like, prospect. But I think it's important to recognize that the risks uh, are there. The risk of closure, the risk of protectionism is there. I think it is a fine line to walk the sort of path of protection, protection of one's interests, 
without falling into the trap of protectionism. Uh, and I think we should face up to that risk. I mean, we shouldn't pretend it's not there. It is there, uh, because unless we kind of recognize it, uh, then it's far more likely that we will fall into that uh, trap, which is why I think, you know, it's not a coincidence that in the trade area, as Mark was saying, one does talk about open strategic autonomy. It's an implicit recognition that the, the risk is there. Absolutely fascinating. And you've brought in so many of the topics we would like to discuss. And I've been making notes as, as you speak, Natalie, uh, so we can kind of raise some of these. Um, but before we do, Nicholas Helwig, uh, so in some respects, listening to what everybody's been saying, European strategic autonomy and the reason we're having the discussion is really a sign of our time. So if we put this into today's context, the times we are living in, how would you define European strategic autonomy? Well, uh, my my previous and uh, the previous speakers and the very distinguished co-panelists already brought up so many points, so it's difficult to add another dimension to that. I want to underline what uh, Jim Jim Close said uh, when he said that it's not outer key and it's not in, in, uh, in de uh, independence, you know, not isolation. I think that is very important to underline. And let me maybe then do that on a light note, you know. And, and give an example. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I was stuck with my family a lot. You know, I, I had to spend the whole time uh, with, with my little son and my wife at home. So I was thinking, I really would need more autonomy. You know, I want to watch the foot, football game in the evening and not be, be disturbed. I want to uh, maybe, you know, cook the food that I like or follow some other interests that maybe my, my wife doesn't like or anything like this. Yes, so I wanted more autonomy, more freedom of choice of, to do what I want to do. Did I want to file a divorce? Did I want to pack my bags and move out the next day? Definitely, by no means, never. That never crossed my mind at all. So, you know, there is a huge difference between wanting more autonomy, wanting more freedom or more, more possibilities to act on your own and to implement your interests and to kind of isolate yourself and walk the other way. Um, so, but that was just uh, on, a, on a lighter note to, to, to bring up maybe a bit more vivid example. I think to, to underline a little bit also what, what other drivers are there in the moment, I think it's very important also to highlight the US and China competition as one of the drivers of, of, of uh, why we talk about strategic autonomy today. I think this really risks of we're putting the EU uh, between a rock and a hard place, especially when we think about uh, European businesses that operate in both markets. So the, the, the possible decoupling, or we at FIA call it also balkanization of the global economy, uh, puts up this question uh, of strategic autonomy as well. I think the technological transformation is an important driver, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this later more, but I think the the digital disruption and what it what it means for our industries, what it means also for our societies, for our the future of labor, for example, it really raises a lot of questions about European innovation. It raises questions about how we can preserve our values in 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 this in this new uh, global context. So the technological disruption is is also important uh, to underline. And um, yeah, I think. Uh, how do we reach strategic autonomy? That is then really the question. What does it mean for the, for, the, for the different policy areas? And it was already highlighted that protectionism is only a one element of that and probably even a, a quite small element. Yes, there might be you know, certain industries which are strategic that, that need to be shielded from global competition, especially if this global competition is unfair, but then we get into difficult uh, conversations about how do we identify these industries uh, and there might be you know also protection in protectionist instruments to, to 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 push some of our values but really protectionism is is just one element and I would see two others the other, the second one is uh, that we really have to see how we build more autonomy uh, through the provision of uh, political and uh, and economic um, uh, capacities at home. Uh, on the economic side, how we do we finalize the single market on, on different areas, for example, in the digital, digital sphere or also on political issues. I mean, we can also talk about uh, the rule of law and in, 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 in the state of democracy in the EU and how, how that uh, influences uh, the way we can we can shape global politics, and uh, and the third part is that we can reach autonomy through shaping the global environment. And what I already mentioned, 
uh, that the EU is very active, for example, in, in, in reforms of the multilateral uh, system and, uh, of course, works together with partners like the, the US. So it's, it's protection is one thing, but there's also the provision of, of, of capacities at home, of the foundation at home and the shape, shaping of the global environment. That, that forms part of this, this, this narrative. And, and then we have to talk about different policies really to, to see what, what this means in detail. It's really interesting because clearly then from what everybody said, this is an extremely broad topic, but uh, something I'd just like, before we really get into the nuts and bolts of the argument, let's keep our big picture view. Something that occurred to me is, as you've all been talking, but you didn't touch upon specifically, I guess, but uh, Jim Clue said uh, it, it was almost naive to think that this wasn't gonna continue. Uh, Natalie was saying that, you know, it, autonomy, it's so obvious. Uh, you've said we've got to get uh, Nicholas, uh, the, our, kind of are um, these issues working in order at home in some respects. So let's put it this way, I'm trying to bring all these threads together. Is it not naive to think that the EU is capable of strategic autonomy today, given that it can't get its own issues at home in order, considering how complex it is for the EU to ever speak with one voice, which is one of the big topics we also address when it comes to the EU. So how can you have autonomy when amongst 27 member states who can't agree amongst each other? Um, and I, I think, Jim, would you like to answer that question? Because I disagree with you uh, in the sense <clears throat> I think in many areas we have autonomy. We're the biggest trade power in the world. In Geneva, we are at least as important as the United States. Uh, with our single market, we are regulatory power. So this idea to say, and you seem to refer that because we have discussions before we reach agreement, that's a problem. No, that's the way the union functions. We try to federate 27 national interests and create a common interest. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, so I, uh, if you, and that is why I never start with defense because for the reasons which uh, Natalie and I think others as, as well used, the defense landscape of Europe was shaped after the failure of the European defense community in the fifties by NATO and the transatlantic relationship. That has not changed and it will not change in the future. So pretending we are going to create autonomy in terms of hard defense is just a chimere. Uh, what the union can do is contribute and become much more active in terms of project and all of that. But uh, I think uh, Niklas uh, uh, mentioned the question of how to do. I mean, we're talking, we should not just talk about a concept, we should think operationally. I think there are three levels. The first level is very important, it's attitude. Uh, Nicholas mentioned the question of geopolitics. No, we have to decide where we want to be on the international chessboard. Now that immediately raises the question, our relations with China and the United States. Now, in my view, we of course, if, if you look at the division uh, uh, we said about our relations with China, it's about cooperation, competition, and uh, confrontation, or let's say systemic rivals. Now on the systemic rival thing, we're with the Americans, obviously. And if the situation deteriorates, which I do not hope towards a block mentality, and that's some of what the things the Americans are doing, we should be a bit careful about that. We should also look at the cooperation and competition. Sorry, part. let me interrupt you there quickly, Jim. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? What, what should we be careful about when you- I mean, I mean that if the Americans now seem to target China as the big adversary and putting a lot of emphasis on the adversary, in my reading, we have to be careful here. Uh, we do not want to put China into this position, even though we fundamentally disagree with its system. Because if we do that, we are going back to a block version of the world, the West against the rest. And I fear some people disagree with that, but I think that then an alignment of Russia on China, which you already see many signs of, could actually be the outcome. So we have to know about our place in the world and we have to look at the world as it is. Secondly, we have to look at our policies, draw all the lessons from what we've seen in terms of our strengths, which we should use, and our weaknesses where we should try to fight again. Be on the digital area where we're very good in regulation, much less good in having champions or in developing the technologies. Uh, uh, and there are many areas like that where we had to learn from the crisis. 
I would in this context also add one other thing to what you said initially. If you look at the state of the European Union in 2008 and today, we are actually much more integrated because in many areas, we were just obliged to draw the lessons from what happened. And the, so I am very much in favor of a, a very serious and systematic analysis of our various policies. The Commission has started doing this and they should do it more. My last point is, uh, obviously, we should continue also to defend our values, but we need the right balance between interests and values, because if we don't defend our interests, we will lose interests and values. We should go for multilateralism whenever we can, but there are situations the others don't play ball, then we have to have the instruments, including autonomous trade measures, where we can defend our interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, is it, I'm just realizing how interesting this topic is, and there's so many issues to read, to come talk about. But something that you just said that that um, the EU needs to understand really where it's going to stand in terms of the US, particularly China, as you were saying. Now, in the NATO summit recently, um, Ursula von der Leyen was very careful to say that the EU is uh, well, China is a systemic rival to the EU, but she was very careful to, to basically put that in terms of human rights. So do you see the EU already in terms of China differentiating its approach to China from that of the US? Um, that it is aware, as Jim was saying, that there is a danger of just kind of joining the US in having China as the all out rival. The EU in other respects might try and return to its more diplomatic position, but in a new context between the EU and China, and maybe therefore define that role of autonomy uh, in terms of international relations. Now, Natalie, as you are going to have to leave uh, a bit earlier, let, let me put that question to you. So do you see the EU redefining its role in terms of this new context? We've got a new Biden administration and uh, China. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of remarks on, on, on the China and the triangulation with the United States and, and the broader international system. Um, I mean, I think that European views on China have hardened quite significantly over the last, I would say, three years, certainly so over the last year and a half of, of, of the pandemic. So I think that whereas once upon a time, we, and I'm slightly caricaturing here, but Whereas once upon a time, we used to sort of look at China as being, yes, you know, I mean, sort of slightly aggressive in East Asia, but, you know, deep down, we kind of thought we don't really have a dog in that fight. Uh, and we looked at what China was doing westwards, uh, basically its Belt and Road uh, initiative as being relatively benign. I think over the last few years, uh, we have increasingly started appreciating the strategic edge uh, behind initiatives like uh, like Belt and Road. So, you know, and then, then I think over the course of this pandemic, you know, we, we have seen the way in which the Chinese have used uh, propaganda over masks. And, I mean, I, I think we're beginning to wake up. Uh, and I think this, this waking up in Europe has led to an extent to greater intra-European convergence on China. In the same way, mind you, as I think that this, I mean, I think exactly the same has happened vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is a, a different conversation, of course. Um, having said that, I do think, so I think in this respect, we are moving closer, if you like, to the United States. Uh, there is obviously still a difference uh, with the United States. I'm not sure how much it really boils down to the fact that the United States has uh, a higher, or takes a harder line to China than we do. Yes, there may be, if you like, at some point, you know, in the debate, for instance, about decoupling, uh, you know, a United States that would edge, if you like, um, towards the, if you like, you know, in the sort of security versus openness or interdependence, our spectrum, uh, it could be that the United States edges more to the right, <laughs> right or to, to one end rather than the other. But I, I think that we are now increasingly cognizant of the security risks of complete openness, which gets us back into the whole debate about protectionism, right? Um, so, you know, I think there is a negotiating space there, but it's not as if we're a million miles apart from the United States. What I think is important, though, to us as Europeans is that we want to make sure, and this goes back to autonomy, that we are the ones 
that choose exactly where we stand. We don't want to be told <laughs> by the United States. We may end up in exactly the same place as the United States, but we want to make sure that we're the ones that, that make that, that choice. Uh, a final remark that I wanted to make over all of this, which then actually sort of, I think, touches on a much broader theme uh, about sort of human rights and, and, and democracy. I mean, it seems to me that uh, particularly now with the Biden administration, the confrontation with China uh, has acquired, if you like, Cold War-like connotations to the extent that it's become and it's being conceptualized as a confrontation between political ideologies and political systems. So it's no longer, uh, you know, a sort of Trumpian uh, confrontation over tariffs as opposed to 5G, as opposed to security, but all of these things are tied together by the fact that there is a confrontation between political systems. It's democracies versus autocracies. Now, I think what's kind of interesting about all of this is that it um, sort of, it means that values are re-entering the scene in a way that I think we had forgotten for the last decade. I think for the last decade, it was all about geopolitical rivalry and we had to be big, bad and ugly ourselves too, because, uh, you know, forget values and forget democracy promotion. The world has become a tougher place. I mean, that was the world we lived in. Now, yes, the world is a tougher place, but it's really being characterized uh, by values, uh, by the nature of political systems. And I think as Europeans, we kind of find ourselves, I mean, we, we kind of sort of, it took us a while to exit the sort of enlargement neighborhood policy, um, you know, sort of political conditionality through trade agreements. I mean, it took us a while to kind of, exit that mindset. Uh, and now that we're all here about talking about geopolitical rivalry, we see that actually it's the United States that comes back with values and we're kind of left slightly behind the curve. And so we don't really know what to do uh, when it comes to kind of Hong Kong or Xinjiang, but we don't even know what to do about Belarus, you know, let alone China. Um, but, but you know, so we're kind of, as I said, we're slightly behind the curve on an area which kind of used to be our terrain. Um, but the instruments, if you like, that we have belong to an international context, which was that, you know, the good old days of the international liberal order that has gone, and where those instruments that we had developed to promote values, like enlargement, like neighborhood policy, uh, like our development assistance, I mean, you know, that the, those instruments were conceptualized in a context that has, that has disappeared. So now when we're faced with those violations of rights, we actually don't quite know what to do. <laughs> okay, that's fascinating. So Mark, well, what do you think about this? You're at the heart of kind of EU decision-making, EU thinking. Uh, the EU has been recognized around the world for its, uh, at least its speeches about values, not always its actions, but you know, values are one of the fundamental pillars of the EU. Is it now behind the curve on that, as Natalie says? Well, I mean, of course, you can never measure that. It's a question of assessment. Um, I do believe that we have always, you know, underlined the importance of values in, in international relations. And I think we will continue to do so. Um, on the other hand, of course, uh, when the rubber meets the road, uh, there is always this um, um, uneasy balance between, uh, you know, interests and values. Um, with regard to the uh, the China question, I mean, obviously, indeed, uh, we have taken a dimmer view of China, uh, as we have also done with regard to Russia. Um, but it's also true that there is a G2 dimension, a G2 dimension of he, a, a, the quest for hegemony. Um, and we have to, uh, when we line up with the US on many, uh, in many areas, we obviously have to do this with our eyes wide open. Um, uh, we should not in, be instrumentalized, at least not without our consent. Uh, in this G2 battle. Um, and one area, for instance, where, where, where this is clear, but I, I, I don't think the issue is, is, is there already, and I hope it will never be, is for instance on climate. Um, we only have one planet. 
it would be insane to say we're not going to work together with China or Russia uh, because of our values uh, or because of the fact that the U.S. says, listen, you know, we have the world of democracies, that's one block, and then you have the rest. Um, you know, climate is, a, is an area that doesn't lend itself for these sorts of tactical considerations. Um, so that is the, 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 the issue of, uh, of values uh, that clearly plays an important role, uh, but we should not push it to such an extreme that it becomes uh, then a constraint on cooperation for uh, or in areas where we, we actually don't have the luxury not to engage. So just a little sideline there, Mark, because uh, you, you've brought up the issue of climate. Let's talk about it straight away then, because in terms of climate, now the EU has been ahead of the game here. Um, and if anything, to me, it probably is the clearest example, and, but there are many others, where EU, the EU has taken the lead and it has been bold in taking that lead and saying, you know, we're going to do things differently. So when it comes to this issue of strategic autonomy, do you think that this climate issue is one that has garnered the EU a lot more credibility globally than in many of its other attempts to do so? Well, first of all, I think because of the, our track record, as well as the fact that now we have the climate law and that we have done the 55% uh, the target, then on the 14th of July, we're going to come out with a big, big package of measures to get to the 55, that we are seen in the world as leaders. We are a green superpower. If there is still one area where we are a superpower, it's in the green. Um, now, um, yes, that gives us leverage. On the other hand, uh, and I experience that on an almost daily basis, even though we are seen as leaders, if, for instance, we lobby third countries and say, you have to do more, you're not ambitious enough, you have to step up your climate action, they will listen to us. But often, because of the fact that leverage uh, is multifaceted, even though the U.S., and I, I'm not saying this uh, in any way to criticize uh, the Biden administration, um, even though the U.S.'s track record on climate is less robust than ours, if they talk, say, to some of our Asian friends, they have a bigger power to influence than we have. And that, but that has nothing to do with green. That has everything to do with many other things of geopolitics. Um, now, with regard to strategic autonomy and climate, there is, of course, another dimension, and we have already uh, touched upon that uh, at the beginning of our uh, meeting here. We need to go through a massive energy transition. The green transition is for 90% an energy transition. For that, we need a massive buildup of renewable energy electrification and green electricity. For that, you need a host of raw materials whose deposits are more concentrated geographically than with oil and gas. So there you have a new vulnerability that opens up, and we've got to make sure that the supply chains with regard to those raw materials, and more generally, the technology with regard to renewables, uh, is sufficiently under our control. Otherwise, we're going to have a new problem of, um, of dependence. Um, we used to have that in the 70s of the previous century. That was actually the reason why the International Energy Ag Agency was created, that we started to stockpile strategic reserves of oil and gas, precisely because we didn't want uh, Arabs and others to use that against us as they had done in 1973. Um, these sorts of things are now coming back to the fore. We have to make sure that we have strategic autonomy in the energy transition. And that is absolutely critical. And what's so interesting is how these issues, as we were saying, they're all so interlinked and so interdependent. Now, Nicholas, I could see you nodding there. Um, I could actually also see you nodding while, while Mark was uh, speaking there. But 
would it strike you now that in terms of climate, but then we're also talking about supply chains and, and that covers a whole load of topic, topics, including trade as climate does include trade, but would you see the EU really at a critical turning point uh, in terms of this strategic independence and autonomy when it comes to those supply chains, if we focus just on the issue of climate here and how can it leverage that now to make sure it stays in the lead and doesn't lose out? So I think the way the EU tries to go now about this issue of green transformation by, by looking at, at um, supply chains is a very interesting case, uh, which exemplifies actually the new way of value promotion that the EU does. And we talked earlier, Natalie mentioned this uh, as well, um, um, the limits of the EU to promote values and, and, and how it how it to some extent also isn't this kind of normative power anymore that it used to be. I think um, the mode of value promotion has changed and it is now the EU is basically outsourcing value promotion to the private sector to some extent because it has this market power, the single market power and this uh, regulatory control over its businesses and its uh, competences when it comes, for example, to passing a supply chain law. So. I think this example now of greening the supply chains, passing a law that um, that, that that monitors uh, the imports of, of carbon heavy uh, uh, products within supply chains is, is a perfect example of this. But it's not only with, done within. And now I'm I'm leaving the, the green agenda. Uh, sorry, but it's not only done done on the values of climate change. It's also done on the values of human rights. It's not that we promote only human rights anymore by, by our enlargement agenda, by our neighborhood policy, or by um, diplomatic engagement with China. No, now we want to really turn the screws and use our economic market power. And uh, the EU is currently discussing new, uh, new due diligence law that also looks into uh, supply chains. And if parts of the supply chains um, include forced labor, include include child labor, for example, but also uh, include um, um, land grabbing or um, um, uh, uh, corruption, for example. So we use the promotion, we use these supply chains now um, um, and to, to, to promote our values abroad. And I think uh, this, is, this is one of the most interesting changes what we see in, in, in the EU's global role in the moment, that the EU is really willing to use its market power for that. But it also comes with a host of questions how this is going to be implemented. How do we uh, cooperate with our own private sector and businesses in a way that they, that they can implement these, these requirements? Uh, how do we ensure that they still uh, stay globally competitive while implementing those uh, so so it, it, it opens up new new conversations and new questions but i think this is really something to to to, to pay attention to uh, jim new conversations uh well, i can see you've raised your hand there yeah. as well um, but but also new risks as well and, and then you obviously have something you want to add so add away <laughs> yes I, I i want to add something because it's an important point uh, i come back to what natalie said about have we lost our way on values and all of that? I would simply very respectfully to the Americans point out that there is always a strong element of using human rights and democracy also as levers for power. You see it very well with China because of course now also in the kind of fight for human for hegemony, it's of course a good argument from the United States to use what happens with the Yugos and Douglas. I would simply say, and that's where I say, we are of course with the Americans on this, but I give you a very concrete example. We are now being told by the Americans that we should not ratify our agreement on investment. I disagree with that because I do not think, as Mark said, that we should now simply say, we stop working with China, including on climate change, for instance, which would be a folly, because they are doing a certain number of things. Do you know that the Americans have an agreement which offers at least as many advantages as our investment agreement would offer to our own firms? Have you heard the Americans say that because of the Yugo crisis, they are going to denounce it? I haven't heard them. When this agreement was being negotiated, the Chinese were treating the Yugos just as bad as they are now, unfortunately. That is my point. So I'm very sorry. That's where I say, 
also, uh, I think it was Mark, or I forgot who said it, that we will be with the Americans on very important issues, but it's for us to choose. And it's not for the Americans to say that we should scupper our deal with China and no one talks about the American deal. Uh, on climate change, it's a bit the same. We have held the climate change debate open while the Americans didn't ratify Kyoto and then they walked out of Paris. Now, I am extremely happy about Mr. Biden and I think it really heightens our chances to do this. But I want to see the sustainability of the American position. I do not want to rely on the American Senate because uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So they now coming and saying, now we are the leaders in the world like that. I, I, I don't buy it. You know, so that's my point. I, uh, uh, and on values and interests, I mean, this is a complicated issue. Take Saudi Arabia, for instance. What are we going to do? I mean, what are we doing? What are the Americans doing? So I think we should not be naive now in the other way, saying that, yes, human rights. And when we run ahead and we have a purist view of it, which is commendable, but not very effective, while the Americans have this part of it, but they have also a very instrumental vision of uh, human rights and democracy. So we should simply be aware of that and we should decide how we best further human rights and democracy in the world, very often with the Americans, not always. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. But um, really, and controversially, possibly to you guys, the EU hasn't got the best record when it comes to human rights anyway. Is it one to dictate, Natalie? No, no, no. I, I agree with you, but we should not pretend that everything is values. It's not. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that adage. Yeah, I mean, I think, Isabel, uh, and mind you, I think the same argument can be made about the United States. I mean, um, I think now that, uh, in a sense, sort of values have returned to the foreign policy debate, it's important to recognize that we can't and we shouldn't. Um, try and promote them uh, in the way in which we did in the past. And, and let me sort of elaborate on this a moment. I mean, I think firstly, which I think connects to a point, Isabel, that you yourself now were, were, were making, um, I think it is as much a story about protection as it is about promotion. So it's about a protection of, the, of those values internally, because those values internally within the union, as much as within the United States, think 6th of January uh, in the United States are actually being violated uh, within liberal democracies. So what are we going to do to protect our liberal democracies? Uh, not only from sort of external adversaries, but from internal uh, adversaries, and hence the whole debate about nationalist populism, et cetera. So I think that that's one element uh, of it, which connects very much to the, the debate that we're having about strategic autonomy, because we can extend it precisely also to this question of human rights and, and rule of law and democratic standards internally. So I think there's a protection agenda in a way that didn't exist in a sense in the past. Now, I think, you know, sort of coming to the promotion agenda, I think it has implications on that promotion agenda, because I think we can no longer which I think sort of echoes the, the question that, that you were raising, Isabel, we can no longer sort of stand on our pedestal and uh, um, sort of lecture people about what they should be doing uh, because uh, of our gold standards. Well, we, we actually don't live up to those gold standards. Now, I think, you know, this obviously has, um, you know, you can look at it through a lens of, well, we're weaker than in the past. You can actually look, if one is able to, find a quote-unquote positive spin to it. Uh, and I think the positive spin is that of saying, well, hey, I mean, democracy is a journey. It can go forwards, it can go backwards. Uh, and we're not perfect either. Uh, and we're in this journey together, uh, and we don't lecture. Uh, we try and sort of see how is it that we can all move forward uh, rather than backwards. Um, so it is about, in a sense, sharing experiences. And I think sort of, you know, framing it in these ways uh, also enables us to avoid actually uh, making a fundamental mistake, which we otherwise risk making, which is, you know, in this uh, attempt at um, overlaying values onto a sort of geostrategic uh, confrontation, 
uh, dividing the world in a very black and white way, you know, sort of democracies and autocracies. And if we, if we were to do that, then of course, um, you know, the question is, you know, well, where, are you, where are you going to fit uh, the Indias or Turkeys uh, of this world today? Well, if you don't frame it in such a black and white way, I mean, if you do frame it as democracy being a journey and basically this being a story of shades of grey, um, then, you know, you, you can embrace without embracing in a way which is completely kind of blind, you know, pretending that violations don't exist. You're upfront about those violations. Uh, so you don't try and cover them up, basically, uh, but you're out, up front about them because you're up front about your own weaknesses and your own fragilities. Okay, so as you're saying all of this, Natalie, uh, it made me think of a topic that I hadn't actually planned to talk about, but I think it's very interesting because obviously Iran is going to the polls today. And uh, J Jim was talking about how, well, you know, the US almost has to prove itself that it's back uh, at the table with us. And it's, it's a able to take the lead with the EU because it obviously walked away from that nuclear agreement. Um, so is that somewhere, would we say Iran is an area, because the US has pretty much ripped that agreement, that very difficult to reach agreement to shreds, that it doesn't really deserve a place back at that table just yet. It's going to have to prove itself to be able to be a good negotiator and also prove itself in terms of the Iranians, because um, the Iranians also feel that they have uh, been let down. And if we look at you know, the front runners in the election, we also see the impact of that. Um, now, I haven't heard from you, Mark, for a while. Is that something you'd be able to talk about, Mark, uh, in terms of the US, in terms of Iran? And in terms of the EU, where does the EU place itself now if it want to get, you know, if it wants to take the lead here? I have to disappoint you here because I'm, I'm not a JCPOA man. Um, and this is a very sensitive file. So I, I'd rather uh, take, a, take a, um, a sort of out of jail card here. <laughs> Okay, you say you're out of jail, Carl, take a rain check. I was just thinking, yeah, maybe you'd want to talk about this because you're always involved in you know, so many high-level discussions. Well, then I'm going to throw that question over to Nicholas because you're looking pensive. And then Natalie, before you leave us, which is in six minutes, don't go away before giving us a few final thoughts because we'd like to hear your concluding thoughts. Yes, I'm always on the urge of like wanting to, to, to jump in and, and then say something. Sorry about that. But uh, yeah, I can I can say something about Iran. I think uh, on a nuclear deal, I think uh, um, the, the U.S. counter sanctions in the first place and, and the way that they ripped apart the JCPOA. I mean, OK, the JCPOA stayed, but it couldn't be implemented at all. I think that was really one, first of all, one of the main wake up calls that brings us to this discussion today. Right. It's like this prime example of, of what we call weaponized. Uh, interdependence where the U.S. was able because of its position in the, in the global financial market um, um, to impose its will and also force uh, European businesses into compliance with U.S. sanctions. And, and unfortunately, you know, the EU tried really to, 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 to put countermeasures to it. We have the blocking statute, we had with INSTEX, but it wasn't able to hold up its end with the bargain with Iran. Uh, they, uh, for, for a long time at least, continue to comply with the, with the agreement of the JCPOA, but we wouldn't, weren't able to give our end of the bargain, which was basically trade liberalization because of the US sanctions. So I think the question, uh, I would formulate your question a little bit differently. The, the, uh, I think from the Iranian point of view, it is probably not the question whether the US should be back at the table uh, because the US is anyway such an important player and it, 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 uh, in the Middle East. But it's the question, has the EU actually lost a lot of reputation because it wasn't able to fulfill its end of the bargain? And I think the disappointment uh, in, in, in Tehran with the EU's ability uh, to, to, to better implement the JCPOA uh, uh, was was very profound, and I think we lost a lot of reputation and soft power in the process uh, looking forward. And I can say that because I'm not an EU official, but I I, I wonder uh, what, what 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 Jim and, and Natalie uh, think about this, and uh, that the US is at the table. That is clear. I mean, it has to be the US. But we had had the had the opportunity before to play this 
um, um, a negotiator role, this intermediate role. And I think maybe we lost that. Maybe we're out of the game there now. I mean, of course, talks are going on and the EU is still involved, but we don't have the same cloud anymore. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Lots of caveats there. Well, Natalie, as you're going to be disappearing in three minutes, uh, why, why not kind of somehow formulate an answer to that and conclude at the same time? But, but, it, but just funny, just to frame maybe your answer is interesting, isn't it? Because it wasn't through want of trying, was it? Because the EU did try to keep hold of this agreement. But it, as you say, it, maybe its reputation at the time is just not strong enough to actually keep the Iranians on board. Um. Look, I think that um, we could have done a lot better, in all honesty. And, and I say this because uh, that there is a, I think there is a sort of history to this uh, Iranian file, which actually tells us a lot about our role in the world and about the fact that I think on this particular question, and I'm not just thinking about the last five years, I'm just thinking about the story that brings us from 2002, 2003 till today, um, unfortunately don't tell us a very good story. And what do I mean by this? I mean, when the, what eventually became as the E3 slash EU uh, plus, plus three was uh, invented, um, we were at a time in which the European Union was, I mean, I probably in terms of foreign policy, the most, dreadful divide that had ever <laughs> come about after the uh, war in Iraq. Um, we were at a time in which our foreign policy was hardly institutionalized. The post of the high representative had only, uh, had only started you know, two years before. And yet, notwithstanding this, so notwithstanding the division, and notwithstanding, uh, and although Javier Sulana Javier Solana obviously had his own personal credibility, but as far as the institution that he represented, I mean, it was really in its, in its infancy, right? And yet he managed as European Union, so not just as E3, to kind of wiggle into this format. Now that was really, if you think about it, a rather extraordinary achievement. Uh, you know, we normally tend to give credit to Ashton, then to Mogherini, far more than actually we do on this particular file to, to Solana. I think actually that was the real revolutionary achievement uh, that, was, uh, that was made. Um, we then kind of, you know, I think sort of did a fairly good job uh, at it uh, throughout the Ashton and Mogherini periods, uh, up until the signature of, uh, of the JCPOA, so up until 2015. Um, and then I think that, uh, in all honesty here, if you like, I would say that who and what could have done a lot more was more on the E3 side than on the EU side, given the INSTEX in particular. Uh, was was really a member state thing, and and very clearly, I think that period, the last four years, demonstrated that as Europeans, um, we are able to play a role uh, on sort of you know high you know sort of security issues uh, such as as the um, our nuclear file, to the extent that we're in a supporting and supportive mode, in a sense, of, of, of US foreign policy. Uh, when we're not, we are just completely lost. We're completely lost, we're completely unable uh, to, to we, it's not that we can't, it's just we don't want to. So we don't even try. Yes, obviously there are obviously sort of, you know, technical reasons why it was difficult to do so, but in all honesty, uh, there was just not enough of a will, basically. Uh, to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to really run counter the United States. Uh, and so I think that Nicholas is absolutely right. Um, now that, um, in a sense, kind of everyone's seen that the emperor has no clothes on this, you know, yes, we're playing a useful facilitating role in Vienna, but, you know, sort of, we're in a different world compared to where we were in 2015, uh, because we have lost credibility and because the use, if you like, of European facilitation um, is, is kind of, has declined quite significantly simply because the US negotiators are, you know, it's not like, you know, up until 2015, the United States, you know, the, the US 
sort of uh, diplomats in the room had never met Iranians before. And so our facilitation really had some value added. These are the same people as the Obama people. I mean, they're literally the same people. Uh, and so they know the Iranians. I mean, it's not, I mean, they don't need us as much as they did back then. So you have on the one hand, this loss of credibility, particularly in the eyes of the Iranians. And we have the reduced use, if you like, of Europeans in the eyes of the Americans. And so here we are. Uh, and, you know, and <laughs> it makes my heart bleed to sort of speak like this, but, but I think that this is really where we are now. Interesting. Well, well Jim, I, I don't want to lose you, Mark. So you do stay with us, Mark. We're just going to close off this little bit about Iran, which uh, you, you don't want to comment on. But if you do find a little topic you might want to comment on, do say. Uh, but Jim, briefly now, uh, will you yeah. bounce off what yeah. Nicholas uh, and Natalie have been saying? Yes, very, very much so. Uh, I, I'm a retired uh, senior official, so I think I can say something about Iran. I would have said it anyway. Uh, first, uh, uh, Natalie is very right on uh, Solana, by the way, uh, historically speaking, not only as far as Iran is concerned, but uh, remember the quartet in the Middle East peace process where he managed to get us in those times, uh, unfortunately, long forgotten. Uh, on the Iran question, the first remark to, uh, uh, I would like to make is that this had been um, US driven from the start. That's not, I mean, uh, there was a, a lot of hype on the work of uh, Ashton and Mogherini, and they did a very good job and so did Helga. But let's be very clear, this was Burns behind the scenes. This was always American driven. And so the idea to do it, to tell the Americans, no, uh, you have to wait now before you get in there would be absurd in view of the real power structures. That's my first remark. My second remark is, and this is slightly more positive than uh, Nicholas and uh, Natalie, is it was important that in spite of what the Americans did, and which was absolutely scandalous uh, in view of the reality, what Trump did. The European Union's Union kept the unity on the principle of this agreement, with the Brits, by the way. And this is important. It's more important than you think, in my view. Although we were, I come to the other point of the powerlessness, but it was very important because it actually makes it much easier for Biden to come back and to relaunch it. So our, I think this is a very important point. So I am not as negative. Now I come to the question, the, uh, and this is the direct link to strategic autonomy. This is, we are right in the middle of the debate because what happened? In spite of the European Union showing extreme unity on this agreement and what should be done, we were powerless against what the Americans did, and we were powerless against secondary sanctions by the United States. That, for me, is a vital lesson. Now, we're not going to change that overnight. We should maybe not even talk too much about it. We should work on the external role of the euro. We should work on getting stronger. And we would, that in 10 years time or 15 years time, if something like that happens, we can go to the country on the other side, which had respected the deal and say, the Americans want to reintroduce sanctions. It will not work with us. We'll do whatever it takes uh, to help you. So uh, for me, this is an extremely interesting uh, object in discussion, and it's directly linked to the uh, debate we have today. Again, I think the union, we have lost in credibility, but this, this is our usual problem. You see, and that is, again, I say this about China. If the Chinese see that whatever happens, we immediately align to the United States. Why should they talk to the EU in the first place? Why should they talk to us? Or why should the Iranians talk to us? So it's very important that we have our own voice. I never believe in the question of speaking with one voice. That's a silly slogan. Uh, we have many voices, but we need one strong message. And so it is important that on issues like that, uh, we may be with the United States on substantial issues, but we may also, uh, if the Americans take an attitude which we disagree with, we have to have autonomy, not only to state our position, but actually to make it strong. That's my major point. Okay, Mark, so then if we take a broad picture, look at this, Mark, not particularly looking necessarily at the issue of Iran per se, but do you agree with the Jim that really this does serve as a uh, very important lesson, uh, a nasty cold shower in some respects for the EU, that even though it might want this strategic autonomy, 
allies, and I put allies in, in, in kind of uh, quotation marks here, like the US, um, might mean that it just doesn't have the clout to do so. Um, I think the example Jim gave uh, is indeed a, a very telling one. Um, if the US wants to come down on a country or a European company, they can often do so by, for instance, saying you can't trade anymore in dollars. Yeah. <laughs> um, several European banks got cut off that way. Clearly, uh, that is uh, a, an example of lack of strategic autonomy. Uh, we, we've got to uh, be able to withstand blackmail, even from friends. Um, that is something that we uh, are uh, quite familiar with in a trade area, where uh, indeed uh, we are not going to be pushed aside. Uh, we can retaliate and we have retaliated. Um, the same goes with regard to our belief in multilateral rules. Uh, if the rule book is incomplete, as for instance, is now the case with the World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization has rules that were written with market-based economies in mind. Now we have a number of major state capitalists playing, and the rule book is incomplete. We were working on this, but it takes ages to get to an addition of the necessary rules to the rule book. Well, then we have to see what we can do autonomously to make sure that uh, our um, interests are, um, are safeguarded. Um, so um, these are good examples uh, where, um, you know, we always have to hope for the best, but we have to prepare for the worst. And that means to have the tools available if the going gets rough. So I'm going to do a bit of a sharp turn here because we're running short of time and I would like to look at the issue of digitalization, technology and innovation. And ironically, in many ways, I think that there are just so many counter arguments running here because we know yet yeah, in innovation, uh, the EU is strong, but it doesn't seem to be able to stand out in the kind of global field. But in terms of regulation, it really is a leader and we're seeing the US now you know begin to kind of listen in to what the EU is saying whereas before well with Trump you know they, they were loggerheads with each other so if we just take a, a broad view of this issue and let's first of all focus on regulation because I find it very interesting um, and let's take a look at GDPR where does the EU stand in terms of GDPR in terms of actually being the block that actually creates the rule book, whereby other blocks, other important powers are gonna dip in, look into it and possibly replicate, Nicholas. Yeah, I guess the, the uh, GDPR is, is really the prime example of, of what has been dubbed the, the Brussels effect and the, the external effect of, of regulations that the EU has. Um, I'm, I'm a bit wondering, um, however, if we are overemphasizing um, the effect of this regulatory power. And I think there are uh, uh, um, um, certain trends, maybe longer term trends that, that, that might might go to our disadvantage. And one is definitely that uh, when we look at the importance of our market and our digital industry, uh, we are lacking a little bit behind. Definitely the US is, uh, big, uh, big tech companies and also of course uh, against, against uh, Chinese competitors which have uh, the power of the Chinese state behind them. So when we think about the future and, and possible, you know, the sh shrinking of the importance of the did, uh, of the single market, uh, then suddenly maybe in the future those regulatory global effects uh, will be less. So when we, so um, without being an expert on regulatory things, so I would, would kind of also focus on other aspects of this digital agenda. And I think it's not only about uh, regulation, it's about the, very much about the ability to innovate 
Um, it's about also the ability to finance innovation uh, within the EU. So think about, you know, the, the availability of, 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 of fin financing of, of startups in the United States uh, and what kind of Uh, what kind of sums are behind uh, small businesses that can then easily scale up. I think uh, there we are lacking behind. And then it's very much about uh, the promotion of, of values. And, and then it's not only about regulation, but it's also about, you know, shaping the multilateral agenda in a way that, for example, our our uh, understanding of, of privacy um, is, is, is upheld. And um, what I find interesting in the, in the digital debate is it, it kind of exemplifies how different the approaches are of member states still towards the promotion of strategic autonomy. Because I think all the member states kind of, or maybe not all, but most of the member states share the same goal that the EU should become more competitive on, on, on digital issues and on digital industries. But then you have uh, very different approaches how to go about it. When you look at the here up north, the, the Nordic and the Baltic countries, they think that the best way to, to, to reach more competitiveness is to have a more competitive single market and to have the single market uh, um, on digital issues completed. And we re recently had this initiative by uh, Chancellor Merkel together with the prime ministers from Estonia, from Finland and from Denmark. So it's really about you know, creating a good internal competition, a good single market so that we can create the next Spotify maybe rather here than, than somewhere else. Uh, while when you look towards France, uh, they rather uh, have, have a more protectionist idea about how to create global champions. And they see, you know, that uh, digital tax is important, that, um, that um, uh, su uh, subsidizing European industries are much more important than having this competitive approach. So I think there's a little bit different philosophy, you know, while, while in the South, they, they prefer to Uh, to, to find the, or to, to support the ancient Siemens here in the, in the North and in the Baltics, it's about finding the next Spotify in this digital competition. So um, uh, it just highlights how, how, how it is really about these policies when we talk about the, the promotion of, of strategic autonomy. Uh, Mark, then, would you say that these different philosophies within the EU itself are part of the problem, therefore, in making the EU, as Nicholas was saying, lag behind globally uh, in, and, and be less competitive on the world stage? And thus, again, if we bring it back to this issue of strategic autonomy, uh, make it lack autonomy like it, it, it can't define a strategy in some respects if we break the the term apart well um i think what nicholas said was was, was very right uh, there are different views on what is intelligent technology policy what is intelligent industrial policy that debate would never go away uh even you know in the us uh, you have it i'm pretty certain you have it in china even um the You know, industrial policy used to be a pretty dirty word in Europe uh, for a number of years because of uh, those who are old enough will remember the tremendous waste that we created uh, in terms of money wasted uh, in the 70s and the 80s of, uh, of the last century. So for a long time, uh, industrial policy was, you know, looked at pretty uh, skeptically, suspiciously. On the other hand, Uh, we know that there are a number of areas that will determine competitiveness uh, in the next 20, 30 years. Digital is one. Uh, the uh, area I know best is, of course, <clears throat> the green area. Uh, we know that uh, the mastery of batteries, the mastery of hydrogen, the mastery of carbon capture and storage, the future of green cement, green steel, that is where competitiveness will play out. Now, the question is, how do you get there? Um, indeed, uh, creating um, a true single market is definitely part of the jigsaw. Another one is uh, make sure you have uh, the right pricing signals. 
Uh, in climate, we have a wonderful instrument called uh, the Emissions Trading Scheme. That's our workhorse since 2005. It has really led to a spur in innovation. Um, but then, obviously, you also need a public role for pushing these sectors of the future where we are only at prototype uh, scale or we are not at any rate at a uh, scale that we are competitive. We used to be, for instance, very <coughs> competitive in solar. We still are quite competitive in solar <coughs> as far as research is concerned, but we got completely wiped out by the Chinese uh, on solar panels. Um, now, some say, well, that was because we were naive. We had an open trade policy. The Chinese uh, subsidized heavily the production of solar panels. We don't have any production anymore. Um, it's a debate that uh, is now again being rolled out. We have a number of so-called alliances that have been put uh, uh, in place, the battery alliance, the uh, hydrogen alliance, uh, the raw materials alliance. Um, but the uh, question of how you grow global champions, how you make sure that in 20 years time you stay competitive is a debate we're going to have every year. And there is no panacea to this. Uh, so the fact that there is diversity of views in the European Union may actually not be too bad. But it runs the risks, as you're saying, of being drowned out by huge players like China. Now, now, Jim, if we focus on this, the issue of the green recovery, because we haven't really spoken about this, it's not necessarily linked with, the, with strategic autonomy. But if the EU is able to monopolize and really make the most of this green recovery of the cash injection throughout the EU to try and make the EU a player on the green stage, what does it do regarding, and I'm going to use Ursula von der Leyen's term, but put it in a different context, about systemic rivals like China? Uh, Isabel, it is very much about strategic autonomy, actually. Uh, I, I, for me, uh, this discussion, both digital and green, they are, of course, completely related. Um, there is a tendency in Europe to look at things from a defensive point of view, protection point of view, and we need that, also from a regulatory point of view. But if you have a regulation, and within the framework of the regulation, you have no industry, your regulation will either serve no purpose or serve the purpose of the big American and Chinese firms. Take the GDPR. I uh, think it was great in a way, but I think we oversell this. The biggest beneficiaries, in my personal view, of GDPR are the American governments. They managed quite well with it. We provided something, a framework which hadn't existed anywhere in the world, they use it perfectly well. And I tend to say, it's a bit provocative, but I tend to say that we have the protection and the Chinese and the Americans have the data and use them. So we have to get more serious there. So we are always proud about this regulatory effect. It is true, as Anna um, Bradford explains in the Brussels effect, because of our power, economic power, because of our single market, we are a regulatory superpower. That is true, but let us be honest, uh, there are yawning gaps in our internal market concerning services and particularly in the digital area. Uh, we have to, so the single market there, as Nicholas said, I am with the Northerners, but I'm also with Mark and the Southerners. You need both a strong and vibrant single market, which is not existing in some areas where we need it like digital, because with him, it seems sometimes to me that those who use our single market digitally best are the Americans, not the European firms. And it raises the question, which I think Nicholas alluded to. Uh, the GAFAs have no problem with GDPR. Some of our startup companies who do not have lawyers, who do not have a lot of money and all of that, have some problems with it. So we should look at this. Uh, I'm not against it, but we should look at the global picture here. Uh, on the question of North versus South, I have to say that uh, having sat in the European Council discussions for a long time, between 2006 and 2020, all of them, there has been a rapprochement actually between North and South on trade and protectionism and all of it. Uh, you have seen over time and also industrial policy, 10 or 15 years ago, we were not even allowed to use the term. Now, if you look at the strategic agenda of 2019, 
we talk about a strong, vibrant single market and an industrial policy. We talk about reciprocity. We talk about autonomy. We talk about autonomous measures. There has been a coming together. And I think we need both elements if we want to uh, thrive. Uh, and this, of course, completely applies to uh, uh, climate change. I do believe, like Mrs. Van der Leyen says that, and many other people say, that uh, investing in this uh, is not negative investing, it's positive investment because new technologies will have to be developed, but we have to develop them. I mean, uh, the solar example is very good. We have to develop them, but also market them in an intelligent way. So there's a lot to do. All of this is very much about strategic autonomy. We're going to now get to the point where we're going to kind of close this discussion, Nicholas and Mark. Um, but if anything, it's really shown how enormous this topic is, not only internally, but externally, and how many issues it brings into play. Um, we've touched upon them. We've realized how independent they are from climate to digitalization, to geopolitics, to defense. Um, but I, what I think is always so useful in these discussions is that at the end, we draw all these strands together. We look at this issue of strategic autonomy. We, we began by defining it. I guess now, has your vision of this definition changed at all? And then on the basis of that definition, where do you see the EU going next? What are its next steps in trying to make itself more autonomous? What must it broach first to actually make itself a respected player on the global scene, but able to act autonomously? Um, Nicholas, let's begin with you on that one. Yeah, thank you for moderating this great discussion. That was really interesting. And I, 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 on the first question, my, uh, my definition has not changed. <laughs> I think uh, it, it, still, uh, it still stays the same. But what I think the discussion showed was that there is actually value in thinking about European strategic autonomy, not somewhere as a concept, you know, high up uh, theoretical and then get get bogged down in, 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 in debates on different definitions and semantics. No, but trying to, to take this as a concept, uh, take the definition and then think about the different policy areas it's like we did in this discussion today and then really see like where are these policy debates and what are the policy options. And I think that is, uh, that is what, what has to continue now, now under the Slovenian presidency and, and also in, in, in definitely also in the coming years. And I think that's, that, we, but that is what we're going to see. Um, uh, so if I want to make one final point is, of course, these kind of changes to think strategically about your interdependencies and about you know, economic instruments, they don't come easy to the European Union because the European Union is not constructed in a way to do this you know the EU was constructed in a way to keep uh, politics national politics out of economic considerations of the market and, and they, that's why they came up with the, this construct of the European Co Commission and have rather you know a, a, a technocratic government of, of, of uh, economic relations of trade of course always you know uh, um, controlled and, and, and agreed upon by, by the member states and the political side, but then implemented by, well, not, not something like a national government, but, but, but by the commission, which is more by nature technocratic and bureaucratic. But now suddenly for this entity to take over this geopolitical helmet and to think about the instrument kit that it has, has in a geopolitical way is extremely difficult. Uh, it's, and, and, and just one example, the, the G7 decided now on this uh, Belt and Road Initiatives uh, competitor, uh, Build Back Better Globally, I think, you know, so that was Biden's initiative from the national level to the international level and to promote values in, in, in from the Western Balkans down to, to Asia, uh, which, which are rather in line with, with the US and Europe. And, and, and not in line with so much with, with the Chinese values. Uh, uh, what I first thought of, hey, the EU has this connectivity strategy from 2019. It is actually in the moment discussing of, of becoming more political on this connectivity strategy and the member states are willing to do that. Who is still a little bit like, you know, 
caught in this more technocratic spirit of using infrastructure, using partnerships in the in the neighborhood towards China. That's the commission. And it's understandable because, you know, it, it, it doesn't treat partnerships and development instruments like geopolitical instruments, but, you know, as programs that are being implemented on on basis of for priorly agreed conditions and whatnot else so that just to underline there's also a lot to do on the strategic and uh, cultural mindset rather in, in in brussels as well to to implement the strategic autonomy agenda many thanks nicholas and many thanks for for bringing up that belt and road uh, initiative partnership between the eu and the us that was something i wanted to raise and and didn't get to it so thank you very much uh, Mark, if we take this then maybe through in your concluding thoughts through a climate lens, um, I can only imagine, like Nicholas, your definition of strategic autonomy has not necessarily changed, but COP26 is just around the corner. Um, what are the next very important steps for the EU for it to take to continue taking the climate lead and being able to act autonomously. Oh. My, uh, my definition hasn't changed. Um, I, um, I can only think about those things usefully in operational terms. Um, so, you know, we, we've got to address the vulnerabilities we have uh, that will clearly uh, make us more autonomous. That doesn't mean that we have to act autonomously. We need to have the potential to act autonomously. Um, so um, on energy, on digital, on uh, climate, on trade, many other things, we need to really systematically look into the question, where are we vulnerable? And what can we do about it? Now, on the question of climate and, um, and the COP uh, and, and strategic autonomy, um, they're obviously uh, the main question, which will be quite controversial, which is already quite controversial, is uh, the proposal we're going to come out on the 14th of July on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, we already got in G7 an important uh, victory that was not really noticed very much. And that is that the G7 has recognized that carbon leakage is a serious problem. We need to do something about it. Well, we're going to come up now with a proposal to do something about it. Um, whether others are going to like it, we don't know. Um, but it is an answer to a vulnerability we have. Uh, obviously, the best would be that we would get to something of a multilateral deal or a plurilateral deal. <clears throat> but the trouble is that international organizations really take too much time. You know, all of the problems we are dealing with uh, in many of the international organizations <clears throat> that have been created to address these problems take years, decades, and we don't have that time anymore. So we have to see what we can do. We're now going to go for it, for, for a, a solution which is actually unilateral. Uh, we hope that others will join us, uh, but that is uh, one concrete example of us acting autonomously uh, having the courage of our convictions. We know that economists are on our side. They have always told us the first best answer to climate change is carbon pricing. We've, been, we've done that. Uh, let others now also follow our example and we provide with the CBAM a, an incentive to do so. But this is a good example of strategic autonomy in climate politics. Mark, many thanks. And I'll give the final word to our host in many respects. Uh, Jim, 
what are, what are your final thoughts when it comes to this? Give us a broad picture view. Um, again, I guess your definition hasn't changed, or maybe it has, or no, the nuance. No, it hasn't, really, Isabel, it hasn't really changed. I see the time, so I'll be extremely uh, quick. First of all, I agree with everything Nicholas and Mark just said. In many ways, uh, what I want to underline is we're not starting suddenly something completely new. Uh, we have worked on strategic autonomy without knowing it when we created a common uh, trade policy, for instance. During the crisis period, we have done strategic autonomy by strengthening economic coordination, by empowering the central bank to do more. So we've done it. What I do think now is we need a conscious effort to draw the lessons. That's the important thing and the most structured one. We need a change of attitude. It's slowly happening. I talked about that before. We need a method and we need a process. You asked the question uh, uh, or someone talked about where are we going to get it? I mean, the answer is there is no end of history inside as far as strategic autonomy is concerned. This is an eternal debate which will go on. And so it's not a matter of saying now we have it. We'll never have it completely. It's an ongoing process. And that's the lesson I would draw. But the important part is rather than having very theoretical debates about it, I think like all four of us tried to do today is to look at it from a concrete point of view. And I would conclude with what I often said to my collaborators uh, when I worked in the Council Secretary is just do it. Just do it, the continuation of a journey. Well, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, Natalie Tocci in her absence, of course, uh, Nicholas Helwig, Mark Van Hooklen and Jim Kloos. I've really enjoyed this discussion and uh, I hope you have too. Sorry that we've overrun a few minutes, but we're not bad. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.